PID control, proportional integral derivative control. Oh my God, such a big and interesting topic today. So if you remember our discussion we had in the past, we had said that the proportional derivative control law was analogous to the phase lead controller because they were both improving the transient performance of the system. And similarly, we had said that the proportional integral controller was analogous to the phase lag controller or compensator because both strategies were meant to improve the steady state performance. And this is where the analogy between PID control and lead lag compensator that we saw last time is the analogy, all right? Because a PID controller is sole objective is to improve both steady state as well as transient performance. So we're combining the beneficial effects of a PD controller with a PI controller in a single unit, very similar to what we did with the phase lead lag compensator last time. But the, the beauty of PID control lies in the fact that we don't need to have a mathematical model or a plant transfer function of the system we are trying to control, okay? Because a PID controller, in terms of its design, is based on a very systematic uh, idea where we're going to use empirical rules to come up with the design of the KI, KP, and KD control gains. So instead of calculating those control gains based on the plant dynamical model in the form of a transfer function, we're going to rely here on empirical rules that were developed many, many years ago by two gentlemen known as Ziegler and Nichols. All right, so that is the topic for today. So PID control. And specifically, how can we come up with the design of the control parameters that exist in the control law? using those empirical rules I've talked about, known as the Ziegler-Nichols PID control design tuning rules. So, Ziegler-Nichols, spelled like that, N-I-C-H-O-L-S. So they came up with two different rules to tune the control parameters of the PID control law. The first one let's call it case one or rule number one because this is really an empirical rule consists in taking our plant which could be considered as a black box because the whole idea behind those two rules we're going to see today is that you don't need to have the mathematical model of the plant or the system you want to control with a PID controller. So I'm going to say plant question mark. So we're going to treat the plant essentially as a black box with one input and one output. So obviously for the design methodologies that we'll review today, that we'll learn today, we assume that although this is unknown and considered a black box, we need to have access to its input and to its output. Because the first rule says the way to design the PID control gains is to feed our plant, our black box, with a step unit signal like this, okay, T and this is the input of the plant U. Step unit, meaning that the magnitude of this is one. And then, so we're feeding this unknown plant with this known signal as its input, and we're gonna measure what we see at the output of the plant, Y versus time. So obviously, because we are feeding the step unit function at some time different than zero, denoted by T naught, between zero and T naught, we shouldn't see anything coming out of the plan because there's no input yet. So everything starts at T naught. And then we should see something like that. 
all right? Because the plant has some dynamics, and those dynamics act as some sort of filtering effects of those sharp stepped unit input that we are feeding the plant with. So it would be nearly impossible to retrieve the same output uh, corresponding to the same input. So obviously there is some filtering action or smoothing action of the input, and this is due to the dynamical effects contained within the plant. So we're gonna look closely at how this response is characterized in terms of parameters, and based on those parameters that will be determine empirically just by looking or measuring what we see at the output, will tie those characteristics to the PID control parameters using a very empirical methodology. Okay? That's the idea behind rule one. So, what we're seeking is to come up with the control parameters contained within the PID control law, which is KP times 1 plus 1 over the integral component. So this is the proportional component, integral component, and then you have the derivative action or the derivative component quantified by TD times S, remembering that S is a derivative in the S domain or in the Laplace domain and that your one over S is an integrator within the Laplace domain. So really, while both rules, not only rule number one, but rule number two, are seeking those specific control parameters that exist within the PID control law. And of course, such control law would take in the tracking error as its input to calculate the control input that would be applied to the plant. All right. Before we jump in into the specific methodology for rule one, it is very important to understand that because those two rules that we'll see today are empirical in nature, that implies that the values we'll find for those three control parameters won't be exact. And what I mean by that is that the, per the performance you're gonna get by implementing those three control parameters within the control line and applying that to the plant, you're not gonna get an optimal response in terms of uh, getting a stellar, say, settling time or minimizing the overshoot as much as possible or to aim for a very specific pole location in complex plane. That's not the idea here. So this is unlike what we've done, say, with the lead lag or lead lag compensator design methodologies where the strategy was to calculate the desired pole location in complex plane based on some transient specifications, MPTS, TR, TP, and then designing the compensator to specifically achieve the performance we were after. This is unlike the Ziegler-Nickel rules that only allow us to come up with suitable parameters for KP, TI, and TD, or in other words, the control parameters of the PID control law, that would give us some reasonable uh, performance, yet there's no way that we could engineer the process by starting by some very tight specification to come up with those three control parameters. So again, that means that those two rules are here to give us what I would call an educated guess only from which we are free, and you will have to do it uh, as a practice problem, you will have to iterate on those three parameters and play a little bit after doing the design using Ziegler-Nickel rules to improve, say, the maximum overshoot a little bit, or to try to decrease the settling time by some uh, amount. Because, again, the performance obtained straight from applying those either rules 
either rule one or rule two that we'll see today, you're not gonna get uh, the best performance that the PID controller can provide. So it's gonna be up to you to take those three as first guess or first iteration from which you'll have the, the freedom to tune them a bit manually by trials and errors until you achieve the performance you are looking for. So you say, well, that seems like garbage to me. We've just learned a very good design methodology based on the lead lag compensator design technique that would satisfy exactly what we want in terms of steady state and transient performance or characteristics or specifications. Yes, but remember that to apply those design methodologies, we needed to have a very accurate model in terms of mathematical model of the plant uh, that we wanted to control, right? So if the plant is unknown, if you don't have that transfer function G of P that we've used within the design methodologies previously, what do you do? Well, you rely on that design methodology here that is not based on the plant mathematical model to design the control parameter within the control law. Again, it, this is entirely empirical in nature. And this is why PID controllers are often referred to as model-free controllers because they're not based on some model of the plant or some model of the system which you want to control. All right, so hope this introduction makes sense. So let's go back to the details of rule number one of Ziegler Nichols rule number one to design KP, or I would say to select KP, TI, and TD to give us some um, acceptable performance under the situation where the system we're trying to control is considered a black box. We don't know uh, the details of it. We don't have a mathematical model in the form of a transfer function. We don't know much about it. All we have access to is its input and we have access to its output that we can measure uh, how would the system behave when fed or when fed by some known input. All right. So rule number one. I already told you that the idea was to take our plant, which is unknown, and feed at its input a step unit function that would be a new function of time. That will look something like this with a magnitude of one. And then, assuming that the plant does not have one or more poles at the origin of the complex plane, or in other words, assuming that the plant does not have any integrator inside of it. Okay, this is an assumption, because if the plant has some integrator, at least one, and again, an integrator is one over S, or if the plant has at least one pole at the origin, the first rule does not apply. Why? Well, because if there are some poles at the origin of the complex plane within the plant, that means that the response to this kind of input, which is a step unit function, would be similar to a second order transfer function where we would see some oscillations and damping over time. Yet, rule one, to work properly, expect that the output of this plant, when this plant is being fed with this very particular uh, input, would look something like this. Or in other words, something very similar to a first order system. So simply put, rule number one does not work for a second order transfer function or does not work when you have one or more integrators at the origin of the complex plane. Only works when the output is characterized by something like this. Okay. Uh, 
and you could overlay the input just for completeness and that would be signal y function of t so if you zoom on this let me draw it a little bit bigger t and output y the first thing you need to locate on this response is the inflection point right because you clearly see that this kind of increases rapidly and then the rate of increase goes down a bit like this so there is an inflection point typically close to the middle of this and inflection point and that will converge to some value like that all right and that value is constant thereafter all right so the first thing you need to realize is that there are two parameters you need to extract out of this response the two parameters is what you're after the first one is the delay and the delay is found by drawing an asymptote that goes through this inflection point. Okay, so that is a straight line. Let me try some color here. Perhaps in that. Yeah, red didn't work last time. Eh? What about green? Would green work? work? Yeah. So a straight line that goes through the inflection point. So that's an asymptote. Asymptote at inflection point. And so this asymptote will cross the time axis, the horizontal axis at some point here. So between the origin, or between zero and that time, this is your delay denoted by l for lag okay and so l is the delay which corresponds to the intersection of the asymptote in green with the x axis which is the time axis so this parameter is in seconds all right the next parameter is simply the time constant of this curve. And the time constant here corresponds to the time between this first intersection of the asymptote, where you've measured L, okay, like that, and the point where the asymptote crosses <clears throat> uh, the steady state value of this curve, because again, this curve will converge to some constant value whenever t reaches infinity so that is a constant you draw this horizontal line and then the point where the asymptote crosses that max value of the curve you bring this down and the difference between this intersection of the asymptote with the time axis and the intersection of the asymptote with the max value of this curve is your time constant all right like that so let me write it in words so that we're all on the same page t referred to as time constant corresponds to 
the time between intersection two intersections of of what? Well, of the asymptote again. with x-axis, which is the time axis, between that point and between the intersection of the asymptote with this and with, I'm going to say steady state, the value of y of t. Feels more confusing than anything else, okay? But hopefully by looking at the graph here, you clearly see that the time constant is the time between that point from which the delay was measured all the way to the point where the asymptote crosses the steady state value of the curve reported uh, down on the time axis, all right? So those are the two parameters that you need in order to fully determine the three control parameters of the PID, KP, TI, and TD. So as you can see now, this rule is only applicable whenever you have this uh, first order response to the step unit input. Because otherwise you couldn't find those two very specific parameters upon which the selection of the control parameters will be done. For example, if you had something like that, right away that rules out the, uh, the use of that first method by Ziegler's neck, by Ziegler and Nichols. All right, so let's move forward. Now you've uh, determined L and T from the output. And again, remember that to do that, you didn't need to know how the plant is modeled mathematically. This is irrelevant here. Everything is done through experiments. So you plug the step unit input to the black box or to the system you want to control, and you take a, uh, you plug it back to a laptop to read the output, you analyze the graph, you visually determine the delay and the time constant, and boom, you have all the ingredients you need to move forward with the design or the selection process of the three control parameters. All right, so we want Ki, no, Kp, Kp, sorry. KP, TI, and TD, three control parameters that are inherently part of the PID control law I've shown you earlier within the box, the block scene diagram. So those are, or were determined to be given KP, My mic is falling. KP is 1.2 time delay, uh, time constant over time delay. TI, two times time constant. And TD, 0.5 times the time delay. That's if you want to control or design a PID. The beauty of it is that this empirical methodology is also applicable to PD or to PI, sorry, PI controllers, as well as proportional controllers. So if you are seeking to design a PI, your KP would be equal to 0.9 T over L, 
here ti, the integral component of the control law, would be the time delay over 0.3. And obviously, you don't have any derivative uh, term to a pi control law, so zero. If you want to use Ziegler Nichols rule number one to design simply a proportional controller instead of a PID controller, well, the proportional control gain will be equal to your time constant over the time delay that you've determined visually at the output of the plant. Obviously, there's no I, so you want that term to be zero, or in other words, because this is a one over TI that appears in the control law, you want one over infinity to drive that to be equal to zero, and TD is proportional to the control action, so zero in that case, okay? Good. That's simple, isn't it? So this is very advantageous in real life applications where uh, the operators of a, say, a robotic arm in a machine shop uh, want to design a PID controller for said robotic arm, yet they don't have the proper knowledge to go through the methodology of first mathematically modeling their robotic arm, the robotic manipulator, which could be a seven DOF manipulator, seven degrees of freedom. And they don't have the background as well in terms of feedback control theories to go through the design methodology for uh, lead lag -like compensator design, for example. So those people would just hook up uh, a source signal to the robotic arm, step input function, read out what they get at the output, take some very crude measurement, and use this table, and boom, they're done. Easy peasy. Yet the price to pay is not to get the optimal performance out of the control plant. So you cannot guarantee that you're going to meet some specific uh, specifications in terms of MP, TR, TS, TD, or even steady state tracking error, ESS. Yet you're going to get something that works relatively well. And for all practical purposes, that's good enough in 90% of the, the case. And this is why the PID controller is so widely used in real life applications. Okay? So that's pretty much it for the design methodology under Ziegler Nichols rule number one to select the control parameters of the PID control law. Yet I just want to do some extra steps using the empirical values for the tree control parameters according to this table and see what we get at the end of the day, okay? So the transfer function of the PID control law, generically speaking, is Kp times 1 plus 1 over the is, the integral component. This is the proportional. And then the derivative component is db times s like that. This is the generic representation of that control law. Yet we found under Ziegler and Nichols rule number one that kp as function of the time constant and the time delay of the unknown plant was 1.2 t over l, right? According to this table we've just seen times 1 plus 1 over ti plus 2l, so 2l times s, plus td was our 0.5l times s, okay? So what you can do from here is to multiply this bracket with the 1 over L term, or distribute the 1 over L term everywhere inside, okay? Such that you get 1.2 T, curly bracket, 1 over L, plus 1 over 2 L square S, plus 0.5, 
0.5 times L over L, you cancel out, it just times S. So why do I want to keep playing with that equation a bit? It's just to figure out what, the, what does the PID controller uh, contribute in terms of poles and or zeros at the end of the day. Because just by looking at this generic form, it wasn't clear. So now by keep playing with that uh, equation and substituting the specific values for KP, TI, and TD, we'll see where the poles and or zeros will, uh, will appear in a complex plane thanks to this PID control law designed specifically under Ziegler, Ziegler Nichols rule number one. But don't worry, we're almost there. All right, so this is still for a transfer function of your PID control law, which is what you would have to implement inside the onboard computer. What I'm going to do next is to divide and multiply that equation by 2. I'm going to say 0.6t times 2, so 2 over L plus 2 over 2 cancel out, so 1 over L square S plus S. And then I'm going to multiply and divide what I have inside those curly brackets with S. Yeah. 0.6t, multiplying first with s, so s squared plus 1 over l squared, s over s, they cancel out, plus 2sl, and because I've multiplied with s, I now need to divide with s as well, like that. And turns out, 1 over L squared, L squared, 2 S over L. What I have on the numerator now, just by playing around with that equation, I have obtained a quadratic form. Okay. Which is 0.6 Which is S plus 1 over L squared divided by my S term, and boom. Just like that, I have determined that my PID control law, or controller design, under my Ziegler-Nichols rule number one, consists of adding one pole at the origin, so one pole at the origin of the complex plane, and by adding two zeros on top of each other, where? Well, at s equal minus 1 over l. Okay? So that concludes Ziegler and Nichols rule number one in terms of selecting KP, TI, TD for the PID controller based on two very simple parameters that could be extracted visually out of the output or out of the, yeah, the signal measured at the output of the plant. So there's no mathematical modeling involved. Great news, but again, keep in mind that the price to pay is a decrease in performance in terms of not being able to satisfy precisely some specifications. All right. And also keep in mind that this first rule is not applicable if the plant has one or more integrators fundamentally inside of it. Because if the plant has at least one integrator, it's going to respond 
more like a second order system and it's going to start oscillate and you won't be able to find the inflection point from which the extraction of T and L are being done. Is being done. All right. So just keep that in mind. There are some inherent limitations of those rules. Yet, for all practical purposes, very, very useful. So let's dive into the second rule. Let's say Ziegler Nichols rule number two. Now this one is the one I like the most personally. I don't know why, I just probably learned that uh, rule uh, first when I was an undergrad student way back then. So the way it works is that you have your plant, which again is considered to be unknown, so question mark. So consider that being a black box with one input and one output. And you have, as always, the reference signal, which is being compared to the output of the plant, which could be measured by some sensors to create the tracking error signal E. This tracking signal is within the scope of this discussion being fed to our PID control law, which will then calculate the control input signal to feed the plant width, and so on and so on. We close the loop like that. Yet the way the rule number two works is that instead of implementing a PID control law, to begin with, we'll only implement a proportional control law. Or in other words, a single KP gain. And the trick here is to start by setting this gain to zero. And then slowly increasing it manually. Imagine you have a dial that could control this gain. So you'd crank this dial more and more until KP reaches a very specific value known as a critical value, denoted by KCR. Critical because this critical value is obtained or corresponds to whenever the output of the plant under a proportional control action exhibits a sustained oscillations of a constant magnitude. So you are at the limit between asymptotic stability or stability, depending on which language uh, you're more familiar with. And the so boundary between essentially the left hand side of the complex plane and the right hand side of the complex plane. This is widely referred to as critical stability, marginal stability or in terms of Lyapunov stability terminologies, we call that stability or stable behavior, okay? So let me just draw or open parentheses here to make sure that we're all on the same page. You have unstable region of the complex plane, real imaginary. Unstable is on the right hand side, the complex plane. This side here is a stable region and the boundary between stability and instability is widely referred to as marginal or marginally stable. This is one way to describe stability in terms of stable, unstable, or marginally stable, yet there are other terms that could be used to describe the same thing. 
the left hand side of the complex plane could also be called asymptotically stable. Asymptotically stable. Here is unstable, that doesn't change. But if you use this terminology stream, so asymptotically stable, the boundary between this region and that region is referred to stable. Okay, so you have to be careful because depending on which language you speak, the term stable could either mean the boundary between the, uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the complex plane, or it could also mean the left-hand side. All this to say that here within Ziegler and Nichols, rule number two, the objective is to crank up that gain until you see a sustained oscillation of a constant magnitude at the output of the plant under proportional control action only. So meaning that you seek to obtain a stable behavior or a marginally stable behavior. Those are two synonyms in terms of this discussion, okay? So if you imagine a root locus, just something like that, boom, boom. So whenever k is equal to zero, the poles are at, the, at their open loop location, and as you increase the gain of the open loop transfer function, the poles start to move in a complex plane. We had that discussion a couple of lectures ago. So at one point, if you obtain a root locus where you have branches that go through the imaginary axis and end up in the right-hand side of the complex plane, that means that at some point the gain will be such that the poles end up exactly on this imaginary axis. This is the critical gain value that we've denoted here with KCR. That's what this behavior in the time domain corresponds in terms of the pole location and complex plane. It means you're just on the fence between stable or unstable, or in other words, you are on the fence between asymptotically stable and unstable. Just a little breeze of wind would kick you onto the unstable region. Because if you were to continue increasing this gain, you would see the oscillations start to increase with time. And if the gain isn't too high enough, you would see the oscillations being damped out with time. So just need to hit the right gain value in terms of KP such that the poles end up directly on the imaginary axis such that the behavior is this sustained oscillations with a constant magnitude and there you stop. So you have, so there are two parameters so similar to rule number one of Ziegler Nichols, there are two parameters that you need to extract out of this experimental procedure. First one is the critical gain, we talked about that. The second one is the critical period. And the period between two maximums of this oscillatory behavior. This is one critical period, this is another critical period, denoted by P. CR for critical. And that's pretty much all you need. Because under this second rule, there is another table provided to you that now does the mapping between those two very specific uh, parameters to KP, TI, and TD, which you need to fully design a PID controller. That's all you need. Those three specific control gain values. So the table 
would look something like that. So KP, PI, and TD under the assumption that you are interested into designing a PID controller because again the second rule is also applicable to PI controllers and proportional controllers. Okay, so for PID, the rule says for KP, it's going to be 0.6 times the critical gain value KCR. TI is going to be equal to 0.5 times the critical period in seconds. TD is going to be equal to 1 eighth of the critical period. If you don't want to do PID control, you only want PI, then you're going to select your KP as 0.45 times the critical gain value KRC that you've obtained uh, visually by cranking the gain till you get those sustained oscillations. That's your KCR. Your TI is going to be 1 over 1.2, the value of the critical period in seconds and TD is going to be zero because for a PI there is no derivative term as part of the controller and if all you want is a proportional controller it's going to be one over two times the critical gain value infinity for TI to make the integral term to be equal to zero inside a proportional controller and zero for the derivative term. All right, that's pretty much all there is. Clear as mud? Perfect. Now what we'll do is do exactly the same thing that we did for the first rule, and that is to play a little bit with the generic PID control law and substitute those empirical values for the three parameters inside of it and work with that equation till we obtain a nice form that would directly informs us about the poles and or zeros location in, in the complex plane when the second rule is being used. Okay, so the starting point is the same. Transfer function tied up in my own microphone cord uh, yeah KP 1 plus 1 PIS plus PDS like that KP KP, KP for PID was 0.6. So 0.6 critical gain value times 1 plus 1 over RTI to go back to what we had in the table was 1 over 2 times the critical period, meaning that 1 over TI is going to be 2 over this instead of PRC over 2 or 0.5 PRC PCR sorry and over S RTD was 1 8 of PCR 1 8 PCR times S so if you just look at that it's not obvious where would be the poles and or zeros of that control law so we need to keep playing a little bit more with that equation until we see this clearly. What I'm going to do here is to factor out PCR out of that. Meaning that the first term is going to be 1 over PCR plus 2 over PCR square times S plus s over 8 to the last term. 
Nice. Next, I'm going to factor out 1 over 8, whatever multiplies the S term inside this bracket. So 1 6 times 1 over 8, KCR, PCR, meaning that here we need to have 8 over PCR plus Oh, not equal. <laughs> Plus 16 PCR square times S. Plus S on its own. The next step is to do exactly the same we did with the PID control. Uh, control law whenever tuned with Ziegler and Nichols rule number one and that is to multiply and divide by S everything I have inside the curly bracket remember that uh, not too long ago this is still for JC of S 0. 0.6 over 8 KCR PCR and then, uh, yeah, multiply everything with S on the top, 8S over PCR plus S divided by S cancel up, cancels out, so 16 to PCR square plus S square. And then, because I've multiplied everything with S, I also need to divide everything by S, just like that. And why I wanted to express this in this specific form is because, surprise, surprise, this is a quadratic form, which means that it could be written as S plus 4 over PCR squared and we divided by s again. This is for GC of s for the PID controller. Whenever the three control parameters KI, KP, TI, TD are selected according to Ziegler Nichols rule number two. That's what we get. So if you look at what we've obtained here in terms of poles and zeros, is that now we have one pole at the origin, exactly the same as with the first uh, tuning methodology, right? One pole at the origin, but this time we have our two zeros on top of each other located at S equal minus 4 over PCR. That means that whichever rule you decide to use, and maybe you don't have a choice because the plant has an integrator and won't respond in the way that you need for applying rule number one, but let's say you have a choice, regardless of which rule you're using, you'll always end up with a pole at the origin and two zeros on top of each other on the left-hand side of the complex plane. The pole at the origin is uh, expected, right? Because PID, the I term is an integral term, meaning that you need to have the one over S somewhere in that control law. And that means that one over S is a pole at the origin of the complex plane. So this is expected. And the fact that you have the rest being on the left-hand side is also expected. You'll never want to use an unstable transfer function as a control law because that would just drive the entire closed-loop system to become unstable as well. Good. Again, this is as simple as it gets 
But keep in mind that the three values that you're going to determine using either table we've seen today only correspond to initial guesses. Because again, you haven't used hard uh, requirements in terms of time domain or steady state performance criteria you were hoping to meet. Yet, uh, using those design rules will ensure that you end up with something stable and with something decent in terms of uh, performance. Yet, nothing specific in terms of, you know, meeting a TS of five seconds, maximum overshoot of 10%. It's nothing like that here. Something else to note is that for the second design rule, because you do need to know the critical gain value KCR and the critical period PCR in order to use a table that I've just shown you. Uh, while this and the scope or the framework of this specific course, which is uh, more theoretical inclined as opposed to going in a shop and tuning a robotic arm, right? Uh, we're going to do things using pen and paper and or using MATLAB Simlink. So if you have access to the plant transfer function G of P, and if you still want to use a PID control methodology, although now if you say, well, it's given me G of P, I'd rather use the lead lag design methodology to ensure I get uh, my specifications, you know, uh, in an optimal fashion. Uh, you may still want to design a PID, even though you may know what the plant looks like in terms of its mathematical model. That means that you could be able to calculate the critical gain value and its associated critical oscillatory or oscillation period just by uh, looking at the root locus because again those value would be found whenever you have the poles directly lying on the imaginary axis. And if you remember, the design or the construction steps involved in building a root locus, right? Open loop, close loop, close loop, gain of the open loop, uh, transfer function increases, increases, oh, now you're at a point where you've reached a critical gain values. Well, the very last step of the root locus construction uh, involved the calculation of that critical gain value. Okay, so you know how to do that. And the period would be extracted from the imaginary components of those poles whenever they lie on the imaginary axis because at that point you would get omega, and critical omega, because you are on the imaginary axis. And from there, you could relate omega to the critical period that you need to apply Ziegler and Nickel rules number two, because this is only related by a two pi factor. So from the root locus or from the root per width table as well, it could be another tool for you to determine very easily this critical gain value and this critical uh, uh, frequency of the system. Based on that, you could go back to this very simplistic relationship and then calculate the critical period that you need in tandem with this critical gain value to use the table of Ziegler and Nichols. Okay? I think uh, it should be clear. Uh, it's very simple, uh, very intuitive and very uh, useful in practical applications, okay? So let's do a quick example to bring this uh, design idea together. And for that example, I want you to understand that although I'm giving you the plant transfer function, and that in practice, if you have that mathematical model with plant available to you, you might as well just do a lead lag 
recompense they're designed to improve the performance drastically over what you would obtain by using an empirical uh, methodology in terms of designing a PID controller. Um, yet this is an academic exercise, so we're going to do it nonetheless to teach you and to show you how uh, you could apply the Ziegler and Nichols design idea. All right, so the plant transfer function is 1 over s times s plus 1 times s plus 5. This is given to you. That doesn't mean that you don't have to do some thinking. Because now you have two rules for Ziegler and Nichols. So which one would be applicable to this situation? Well, if you try to apply the first one, you would realize that you'll never be able to obtain the first order like response that you expect with the inflation point inflection point uh, from which you calculate the time delay and the time constant. Why? Because look what you have here. You have one integrator within the plant transfer function or in other words you have one pole at the origin of the complex plane. And you know that Ziegler Nichols rule number one is not applicable under this situation. If you were to have S square, same thing. Because now that means you have two poles at the origin, or you have two integrators. And again, Ziegler Nichols rule number one goes to garbage. So that leaves you with only one option, and that would be to apply Ziegler Nichols <clears throat> rule number two. Then that's convenient in a theoretical example like that, where you could easily calculate the critical gain value and critical period using the root locus methodology or using the uh, Ruth Hurwitz stability criteria in terms of building the table, and that's what we'll do here, okay? Uh, so how, how does that work again? Well, if you want to find the critical gain value, KCR, that when applied to this specific transfer function to your plant creates an output Y that oscillates with sustained amplitude so the oscillations don't grow and don't diminish with time. It means that you need to find this value analytically or using equations. I'm going to say that probably the easiest way to do it in this context is just to use the Ruth Hurwitz table again. So how does that work again? It's been a while, right? Well, you have to first figure out the open loop transfer function. Hopefully you remember what is an open loop. Right, open loop means that this is a transfer function. You have a direct path between the reference signal and the output, or in other words, you come in and you disconnect the feedback loop such that the open loop transfer function G uh, or G O L open loop is simply let's leave it as K P generically because we haven't mess with the value to exactly bring the output at the sustained oscillation point, so just Kp, which is our tuning factor to make that happen, so Kp times this transfer function s and s plus 1 and s plus 5. That's your open loop transfer function, but hopefully you remember that proof per width stability criteria works with a characteristic equation and because 
we are seeking the point at which the gain is larger than zero, right? We've tuned the gain to reach a critical value, meaning that now we are looking at the closed loop poles of the entire system. So we need to find a closed loop transfer function and specifically look at its characteristic equation and use that within the root per width stability criteria. So the closed loop transfer function within this series the organization of those two transfer functions being KP and the plant when you have a unity feedback is simply open loop over one plus G open loop. And because it's been a while that you've done that, let's do it all together. So G open loop KP over S times S plus one times S plus five. This is open loop. All this divided by one plus the same thing. There you go. So what you're going to do next is put everything onto the same denominator here. Okay. You know what? I'm going to use the magic of the board to do that. It's getting late. <laughs> what time is it? It's about 10.30 in the evening. So I'm just going to put that into the same denominator, meaning that I'm going to get S plus S plus 1 oh, times mg. S times S plus one times S plus five. That's my one over this plus that, all right? So you have kind of four levels. This cancels out with that. And you should be left with just KP to the numerator over this as your denominator. S times S plus one times S plus five plus KP. That is your closed loop transfer function. Okay? So with that, all you have to do is to visually uh, figure out what would be the characteristic equation of that closed loop transfer function. That is just the denominator equal to zero. Same old, same old. So, characteristic equation, meaning that this is the denominator of closed loop equal to zero. And we've just found that that denominator was S times S plus 1 times S plus 5 plus KP all that equal to zero. And that marker is becoming a little bit faint and washed out, so hopefully I have another one that works good. Yeah, that one's perfect. Nice. Okay, so let's just multiply everything together so that we have a polynomials essentially with coefficients so we can easily apply the root per width table uh, methodology so here I'm going to get s square plus 6s plus 5 plus kp equal to 0 or s cubed plus 6 s square plus 5 s plus kp equal to 0. Good. And now you have all you need to construct the root per width table. With s3 s square 
x to the 0. And then as you know, you are inputting the coefficients of that characteristic equation okay, inside this table by staggering them. So this is 1, and then skip 1, and you put the 5 next to it, and then you come back in the next line, 6, and kp. Well, half of the table is already populated with coefficients. Great. So that one, as you know, is going to be 30 minus kp over 6. And that one, there's nothing here. Let's put a 0. And that one's going to be this times that minus this times this over this. So overall, just kp. Well, what was the objective here? I'm lost. Oh, yeah, the objective is to design a PID controller using the second Ziegler Nichols rule. What? Wait, how does that relate to this? Well, remember that for applying this specific rule, you need to figure out critical gain value KRC or KCR and the critical period PCR. Well, KCR being the gain that puts you onto the imaginary axis in terms of the closed loop poles implies that within the stability criteria, which is the root per width, means that this would happen whenever you have zero, at least one zero in on the first column here. Okay, so you have two situations. Either kp equal to zero, meaning that you are in the open loop, and that makes sense, because the open loop uh, transfer function was your, uh, just the plan, so you had the one over s term. So even without any gain, or even with a gain of zero, you have one pole at the origin of the complex plane, you have one integrator that exists. This is what this corresponds to. But look at what you have here. You have a non-zero value for kp that would drive the poles to come back to the imaginary axis. And this is found by equating this algebraic expression, expression exactly equal to zero because if this is zero it means that you are again on the imaginary axis and that would just be kp well equal to 30 right <laughs> so kp equal to 30 means that you are on the imaginary axis so we're going to say that our critical gain value KRC is going to be equal to 30. Well, wait, you also had a zero whenever you had KP equal to zero, right? Yes, but that's not the critical gain value that you obtain by increasing KP in the open loop transfer function from its initial value of zero to something known as a critical value. So although initially, and I've just said that, so sorry if I sound like a broken record, uh, initially you already had one pole at the origin, right? Because if I remember on top of my head, you had real axis, imagine your axis. The plant was one over S times S plus one times S plus five, yeah. So that is the situation whenever kp is equal to zero. Yet that's not the critical gain value we're looking for. The critical gain value is the one that will produce a sustained oscillation whenever the gain is larger than zero. And we found that that value is 30. That tells us that the root locus should look something like this. Those two poles would knock into each other. One's going to fly off like that, and the other one's going to fly off like that. And whenever kp is equal to 30, 
then the poles will be directly on the imaginary axis. And that one can care less if going further to the left. Okay? So that's why we found two values, two different values for KP that would drive our system to become, pay attention, critically stable, marginally stable, or stable depending on the language you're speaking. All right. So that's the first value we needed. Well, that was easy peasy. Oh, wait, don't we need a second parameter in order to use that Ziegler Nichols rule number two? The answer is yes. We also need the critical period denoted by PCR. Okay. That shouldn't be too difficult. Because if you go back to the characteristic equation you had, s cubed plus 6 s squared plus 5 s plus kp, but now we know that kp is equal to 30, so let's plug this back into the characteristic equation. We get this. So now our job is to figure out the value of omega whenever kp is equal to 30. And that's convenient because the only unknown in that equation is actually omega, right? Because remember that s, s variable, is the same as j omega. So let's substitute our s variables with j omega, such that we only have omega as the unknown, and we'll then calculate omega, which would correspond to the critical omega, because that would be calculated based on the critical value of kp, that's our 30. And then we relate omega critical to the critical period P C R and then go back to the table that we had for PID tuning under the second rule and we'll be done. So S cube, so that is equal to J omega cube plus six S square. This is J omega square plus five S or five j omega plus our critical gain value 30 equal to 0. I like to decompose my j omega uh, in two parts whenever I deal with orders or yeah or exponents larger than 2. So I like to separate this from the square of it because I know that j square is equal to minus 1. Okay, hopefully that rings a bell. So here I'm going to evaluate directly. Oh no, let's do it one step at a time. Okay. So j omega is j omega. Not much to do with it. J omega square is equal to minus omega because J square is minus one and omega square is omega square minus omega square. Here you have omega J omega square, so minus six omega square plus five j omega plus 30 equal to 0. OK? So this could be written as minus omega square. I'm going to combine my complex terms together. So this is complex. This one is also complex. So minus omega square plus 5. And those two things are multiplying j omega. So this is done. This is done. And now I'm left with two real numbers. Minus 6 
omega squared plus 30 equal to 0. So this is imaginary and this is real. Essentially, this is just some complex number. Um, what we are seeking here, if you go back to the complex plane in the root locus, is the value of omega whenever the real part of my poles are equal to zero. Whenever the real part of my poles is equal to zero, because only then I will be lying directly on the imaginary axis. And that's convenient because by equating this part to zero, the only unknown will be omega. So let's do this. And again, omega is what we are after in this step. So we have uh, six omega square equal let me do it one step at a time. 6 omega square plus 30. I want that to be equal to 0. Or I could say minus 6 omega square minus 5 equal to 0. And that means that omega that would drive this to be equal to 0 would be equal to omega equal to square root of 5. So just omega square is going to be 5 minus 5 equal to 0. Boom, you're done. Now, this is not just some random omega. This is the critical frequency because this is the frequency whenever the poles lie directly on the imaginary axis. And within the scope of the work we're doing today, we've called that point a critical point similar to the critical gain value, okay? Yet that's not what I want. So we're not done. But all we need to do is to relate that to the critical period, PCR. And you remember that PCR is simply equal to two pi over omega Critical or 2 pi over square root of 5. Ha! Huh. And combined with the critical gain of 30, we now have the two pieces we were after in order to apply Ziegler Nichols rule number 2 to figure out KP, TI, TD of our PID control law. So, just to finish off this example and for completeness, we're going to go back uh, to the table that said KP is equal to 0.6 critical gain value. TI was 0.5 critical period. And TD was 1.8. PCR. So if you plug the 2 pi over square root of 5 for PCR inside those formulas and KCR equal to 30, you're going to get the following values for KP, TI, and TD equal to 18, 1.405, 1.4, 1.5, 1, 2, 4, respectively. Now, the only thing left in order to complete the implementation of your PID controller on board uh, an embedded system is to, you know, just implement the control law, which is KP 1 plus 1 over TIS plus TDS. 
you could either just then plug 18 here, 1.045, 1.405 for TI in here, and 0.35124 for TD, or alternatively use the other version we had obtained when we played with that transfer function using those specific relationships. And you hopefully remember that we had obtained something that looked like 0.6 over 8, KCR, PCR, times S plus 4 over PCR square, all of this over S. So this is exactly the same as that, just given now as function of KCR and PCR. So if you don't want to calculate those three individual parameters, you could just use that version and plug directly your KCR and PCR instead of calculating those three numbers and substituting them into this transfer function. Yet the end result is going to be exactly the same. Okay? That's it. But your job as a control engineer is no near uh, to be done because once you've figured out those control parameters associated with your PID controller, you have to remember that that's just the first educated guess on those parameters. So for sure there'll be some fine tuning for you to do. And those fine tunings will have to be done either experimentally or in simulations. Uh, because typically with this initial guess you'll often result in the maximum overshoot on the order of anywhere between 15 and 25 percent I would say which may be fine for you so if you have a very loose design in terms of what you're trying to achieve and you don't mind having 25 percent of overshoot be my guess and use those as is and call it a day but if you want to refine the performance maybe decrease a little bit more the settling time TS or decrease the maximum overshoot by a bit, take those values and do some trials and errors and go from there and evaluate then uh, your new design either in experiment or in simulations. That was a lot. PID Control 101. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned uh, something interesting in terms of design methodology for PID controllers. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye.